Hi guys, welcome back to Reserved Investments on YouTube. So a question I get asked quite often, as a matter of fact, somebody else just left, left me a comment in the comment section of one of my videos asking me to comment on more of the semi-mainstream but obscure video game systems and games that came out generally around the 1990s, possibly in the late 1980s. So in this video, I'm going to give my thoughts on what the long-term future holds for systems such as the TurboGrafx-16, the Sega Saturn, the Neo Geo, and items of that more obscure nature and or collectability. So you have to understand, a lot of people that are collecting vintage video games right now are going after Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Nintendo 64, a lot of the mainstream systems that they remember from their youths. Well, obviously, if you grew up in the late 80s and early 1990s, most likely you could have very well had a TurboGrafx-16, or in 1995, you could have went out and bought a Sega Saturn, because to be honest, Sega was considered the market leader, really, during the 16-bit wars. It just depends on what sales numbers you want to believe as to whether Nintendo won the 16-bit wars or Sega won the 16-bit wars. Nintendo is, ironically, the winner of that war, but it's only because they didn't innovate like Sega did. Sega came out with the Sega CD, then they came out with the Sega 32X, then they came out with the Sega Saturn, which really confused the market. So looking back, you could say because Nintendo stuck by the 16-bit Super Nintendo, they pretty much won the 16-bit console wars. You would not be correct in that assumption. But the truth of the matter is, had Sega of taken a better approach to releasing a more powerful and low-cost 32-bit console and not coming out with the Sega 32X, and or the Sega Saturn as it was, they could have very well been the next generation market leader. And it could have really been Sega competing with Sony with Nintendo trying to catch up. You know, I look at it this way. A lot of people right now think that Nintendo is the clear market winner in the overall video game marketplace because now they have the Switch. Um, before that, they had a hit with the Wii. We're not going to comment too much on the Wii U or the Nintendo GameCube because those systems didn't live up to Nintendo's previous sales expectations. That said, though, what a lot of people don't understand is the only constant in the vintage video game or modern era video game marketplace or even the toy marketplace is change. Market leaders don't stay market leaders forever. And I think there's a lot of people making the assumption that, you know, like great at vintage Nintendo games are a great investment because everybody knows who Nintendo is. And when kids grow up and they get older, they're going to want to collect a lot of the games that came out even before they were born because Nintendo is an iconic brand. Well, yeah, it's more than likely due to the amount of cash that Nintendo's sitting on, they're not going to go bankrupt anytime soon. I mean, even during the... The, the dark ages of what we call when the Wii U was on the market and it wasn't selling as expected. Nintendo still had surprises up their sleeve. One such surprise was the Nintendo Amiibo. Another such surprise was the popularity of Pokemon Go. So Nintendo has shown that even if there's a market turndown in a lot of their core products, they're still able to innovate and they're able to survive long term just coming up with new creative concepts or ways to play. The reason why the Wii was such a hit was it was the first time in the history of video games, pretty much, that someone pioneered the whole interactive video game concept in a manner that even elderly people, to teenagers, to hardcore video game enthusiasts, wanted to play the system, meaning the Wii. Um, that's why Wii Sports was such a popular game. It just appealed to all generations. That said, I really sit here and think there could be a catalyst, much like what happened to Sega, given the fact that Sega is really no longer relevant in the console wars as we enter 2019, 2020. The same thing could happen to Nintendo, theoretically. They could eventually get to the point 
where their home consoles are no longer selling and they become more of a third-party publisher. That could happen, guys. I'm not saying it's legit. I'm not saying it's going to happen. But there is a small chance that over the years, Nintendo may sit back and go, why are we developing hardware like this? We're putting all this money into innovative hardware and we're having both hits, Nintendo Switch, Nintendo Wii, and misses, GameCube, Wii U. So that's one such thing to analyze just on the topic of Nintendo alone. You also have to understand Nintendo cannibalized their handheld business. Going forward, the Nintendo Switch, it looks to be, is going to be their home console and the handheld system console base as well, especially if you look at the introduction of the Nintendo Switch Lite. The Nintendo 3DS is out of the picture. The Nintendo Switch really is the successor to not only the Nintendo Wii and the Wii U, but also the 2DS and the 3DS. That's just where the market's going, guys. You may not agree with it, but it doesn't matter. Consumers already made that decision. So that said, when we go back and we start looking at like TurboGrafx-16, Neo Geo, and Sega Saturn, and I want to just put a caveat out here, I owned a Neo Geo Gold system growing up. I also owned a TurboGrafx-16, a Turbo Duo, and I also had a Sega Saturn. Okay, I grew up to an upper middle class household, so I had access to a lot of these systems. It was very interesting going to school when I was in high school, telling people that I had a Neo Geo Gold system and watching their face fall because they didn't believe me. So I had to invite a lot of friends over to my house just so that they could check it out. Um, I paid $499.99 through Electronics Boutique back in, I want to say, 1992 or 1993 for my Neo Geo Gold system, and it came with two controllers, the memory card, and a copy of Fatal Fury. Um, you could have also got Magician Lord, I think League Bowling was a pack-in at one time, and Baseball Stars. I'm not a sports fan, so I definitely wanted either Fatal Fury or Magician Lord. I was glad I got um, Fatal Fury. The other two games that I owned for the system, I didn't have many. I had the Super Spy, which is still one of my all-time favorite Neo Geo games, and Robo Army. I was setting out to get Art of Fighting. The original Art of Fighting is one of my favorite Neo Geo arcade games. Unfortunately, I was expecting it to hit with a $149.99 retail price. And Electronics Boutique had it for sale. You had to pre-order it or purchase it, and they would ship it out to the store if the store didn't have it in stock. And it was like $229.99. So paying $230 for a Neo Geo game really didn't throw me. So I kind of didn't have too many games for the system. But the games I did have, I played extensively. That said, my favorite system, everybody always asks this, was actually the TurboGrafx-16. The allure of the TurboGrafx-16 to me really captured the, the whole culture and kind of the, the art of the Japanese gaming scene. So I really enjoyed a lot of the older TurboGrafx-16 games like Splatterhouse, Blazing Lasers, Soldier Blade, the Bonk series, R-Type. Um, I played a lot of those games till my fingers bled. That was really one of my favorite systems. Okay, The Sega Saturn, I was kind of disappointed in. I bought that, I graduated high school in 1995. So as a graduation present, since the Saturn launched early in May, and I already had the Sony PlayStation, which was coming out in September of 1995, pre-ordered, my parents thought it would be a cool idea to buy me a Sega Saturn system as a graduation present. So I remember them paying $399.99 for the system the day it came out on store shelves. And I liked it, but aside from Panzer Dragoon and Virtual Fighter, in the beginning there just weren't that many great games that I could sink my teeth into. And that was where I kind of lost a lot of respect for Sega over how they handled the release of that system. Okay. That said, guys, let, let's talk about this a little bit. You have to understand that the TurboGrafx-16, the Sega Saturn, the Neo Geo, and even we can put other systems into the mix, like the Sega Dreamcast, um, even really the Sega 32X, um, even to a certain degree, some of the Nintendo systems, like the, the Virtual Boy would fall into this category, even to a lesser extent the GameCube, okay? A lot of people that are just being born today or who are, or who are either 18, 20 years of age, they're not going to end up collecting TurboGrafx-16, Sega Saturn, Neo Geo, and Dreamcast games going forward. 
It was not part of their generation. It's just like what happened with Atari and television, ColecoVision. You know, I told you guys this before in other videos. One of the things when I was making money back on eBay, flipping that stuff on the market, I would get into heated discussions with guys who were arguing me up and down that even back during the speculative bubble of pre-Nintendo video games, which I did do a video on, if you want to watch that, from 1995 to 2005, where people were pouring mass dollar amounts in pre-Nintendo games and systems like Atari, Commodore, ColecoVision, and television, I was arguing with people up and down, this is not going to be a valid investment going forward. And people would shoot back at me, you don't understand, Atari's iconic. In 20 to 30 years, everyone's going to look at back at this as the golden age of video gaming, and they're going to want these items. Well, in 2019, you can kind of see how that panned out. Were those speculators and so-called investors correct? No. And I've shown you millions of examples in other videos. I know I'm exaggerating with that term. But if you want, I can do a follow-up video where I go through my sales list of what I sold, Atari, ColecoVision, and Television, back in 1995 to 2005, and tell you what it's worth today. And I guarantee you, 90% of those items or more lost 40 to 70% of their value going forward. So be very careful if you're parking significant amounts of money. Not only in graded video games, vintage video games in general, and also more obscure systems like your TurboGrafx-16, your Sega Saturn, your 3DOs, your Philips CDI, your Neo Geo. You know, a lot of people are even speculating, like I talk about Philips CDI, the Nintendo games or the Nintendo licensed games that came out for that system. That really sucked. There was a Zelda one and a Mario one. If you want to pay $100, $200, $300 to get a copy of those games on the secondary market today, you have to understand, most likely as time goes on, at some point, they're going to start trending down and no one's going to want those items. The Philips CDI is not a system I would ever recommend collecting for if, if you are thinking in financial terms down the line. Meaning if you're going to get a system in the games and you're going to pay a couple hundred dollars and sink overall several thousand dollars into a collection of either 3DO systems and games, Philips CDI systems and games, or even like Sega Saturn. Some of the Sega Saturn games I'm going to get to in a minute can be considered very coveted and very hard to find. But that said, if you're going to spend hundreds to thousands of dollars on this stuff and you're expecting to sell it for more money down the line, you have to understand that looking at the market from an aggregate perspective over the long term, a lot of collectors that are now just getting into video games and possibly wanting to buy up some games for their youth are not really going to be too keen on a lot of the obscure systems that are now selling for hundreds or thousands of dollars. I've said this before, going forward, digital downloads are going to be one of the most popular ways to play vintage video games, as well as devices like this, okay? One of the things that I want to point your attention to is there's a reason that companies right now are releasing stuff like the TurboGrafx-16 and PC Engine Mini, the Neo Geo Mini, which came out. The reason being is it's been 20 some years since these systems were in their heyday. So a lot of the people that grew up with these systems are getting a little bit nostalgic and want to buy these items back. Well, I've said this before, collectors are not made, they're born. If you don't have the collecting gene in you, you're not going to look to the market, you know, like Neo Geo collecting. Neo Geo collecting, I was involved in that hobby for several years before I sold off most of the collection. That's a very expensive as hell hobby to get into. Especially if you're talking about some of the U.S. releases like Metal Slug. Even Metal Slug 2 and 3 are not cheap and they're not easy to find if you want them in any type of decent collectible condition. That said, I often tell people, just download a copy of Metal Slug on, you know, like when the, when the Wii Classic Virtual Console was out. You could download it for like 8 or $9, I think, at the time, or 10 bucks. That's your solution. Don't pay $1,000, $2,000 for a game and expect the price to keep going up because Neo Geo is one of those obscure systems where 
if you weren't around in the 1990s, honestly, in 2019, you can pretty much stop 50 people on the street and mention Neo Geo. And honestly, if two or five people out of those 50 have ever heard of it, consider yourself lucky. That's what I mean by what a lot of speculators are doing is they're buying all the wrong items. And that's a prime example because I know there's one person out there who's going after Neo Geo games. They're paying a fortune to get them. They're putting them on their shelf. And in their mind, well, I could sell this for more money in the future. I'm sorry. There's not too many people that are going to come into that market. In fact, I suspect over the next 10 to 20 years, Neo Geo games are going to have a rough time on the market sustaining the prices that they are at now. They're going to eventually start to fall. It's no different. I'll use this as an example. Are you guys familiar with Mark's Toys? Mark's was the premier toy manufacturer in the United States before Kenner, before Hasbro, before all these other companies entered the marketplace in mass. It's just like Mego Toys. There's very few people that are 40 and under that are entering the vintage toy marketplace and buying Mark's Toys and Mego Toys. But here's the kicker, guys. Back in the 1980s and 90s, you would have a hard time collecting the, the speculators and investors who were involved in those markets, buying up Mark's Toys and vintage Mego action figures, telling them otherwise. Today, guess what? A lot of those collectors are running scared because outside of the mainstream Mego action figures that kind of cross genres with like superheroes and other toy lines that people are still into, overall, the prices are trending downward on everything but the rarest and most valuable items. Okay, there are exceptions to every rule. But I would not be putting together a collection of Mark's toys or vintage Mego action figures today for investment. The same thing is what I would tell you guys about the Sega Saturn, the TurboGrafx-16, the Neo Geo, with some exceptions. You know, we talk about Sega Saturn, you kind of have to look at some of the big titles. Panzer Dragoon Saga is a great example. I own, I still, I have owned, and I love Panzer Dragoon Saga. It's my favorite game on the Sega Saturn system. In fact, I was pleased to hear that Sega is re-releasing the original Panzer Dragoon on the Nintendo Switch. That's a day one purchase for me. I will bite the bullet and pay full price for that game at retail because I'm hoping they release the sequel. Panzer Dragoon Zwie, is it? I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I know, but I used to love those two games. As for Panzer Dragoon Saga, I understand that they lost the code or something. I know somebody will correct me in the comments, but... They're not able to release that game without significant work and time invested to recreate that game from the ground up, from the way that I understand it. That's the type of game that, for at least now, is something that will hold value. Whether or not it holds value 10 to 20 years from now and or goes up in value is anyone's guess. But that's a prime example of an iconic Sega franchise that really had legs that again, Sega did nothing with, unfortunately. Unless if you consider Panzer Dragoon Orta on the Xbox, which is another great entry in that genre and that series. That said, there's games of that nature that are few and far between. I would not be putting money into a lot of the expensive working designs RPGs like Dragon Force for the Sega Saturn because a lot of that stuff, the rights are still out there. Somebody can easily release those games as digital downloads for modern systems, or they can attempt to get the rights and re-release them in physical form. That type of stuff, I don't think, is going to have validity 10, 20 years out, in my opinion. Just like a lot of the Neo Geo games. You know, I've said this before, I love Super Spy, I love Magician Lord, Robo Army. Those games are very easy to emulate on systems like the Neo Geo Mini, and even consoles like the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch. They're really not that hard to not emulate to the point where you need to have a physical copy. It's pretty much a waste of money. I don't just I don't see any potential for long-term growth there, which gets me right back to the TurboGrafx-16. You know, a lot of those games have been re-released on the Nintendo Virtual Console. Now we're getting them again with the TurboGrafx and PC Engine Mini. That said, there are some gems in the library, but if you tell me you're going to go out and get a copy of Magical Chase, 
which is one of the rarest TurboGrafx-16 games out there, for those of you that don't follow that market, I'm going to sit there and go, well, I wouldn't be buying it for investment potential. That's the equivalent of someone 20 years ago buying really rare Atari 2600 games, thinking that today, in 2019, they're going to be worth a lot of money and continue to go up in value. I'm sorry to say, even the rarest Atari 2600 games have not done anything significantly in terms of financial gain over the last several years. They're just stagnated at the price that they were at from four or five years back. Again, there are exceptions to every rule. But overall, if you're buying games of that caliber, it's tying up money into something that really has no potential for long-term investment or financial gain. So those of you that have asked me to comment on a lot of these systems, that's what you have to understand. Now let's look at the Virtual Boy for a little bit. The Virtual Boy has some appeal in that it was the first mass failure Nintendo system ever released on the market. So to be fair, if people are going back wanting to collect every single Nintendo system, the Virtual Boy will at least be an interesting curiosity. I'm not saying it's a good investment. It is not compared to other items out there, either in the financial markets or the greater antiques and collectibles trade. That said, though, the Virtual Boy is an interesting curiosity at best. But you really have to understand the market, and you have to realize not too many people, after they're exposed to a Virtual Boy, want to play it long term and or even collect it or own it. I no longer own any type of Virtual Boy products, collectibles, systems, or games. I sold all that like five or six years ago when I thought prices were at their peak. And you know what? Honestly, if you go back and you look at some of those prices for a lot of the quote-unquote rare games, they were at their peak. And they still are. Virtual Boy is not trending anywhere up on the secondary market at present time. Okay? So I just wanted to create this video. I'm not going to go into further detail. We're already at 22 minutes. And I just wanted to give you guys my opinion on some of these more obscure video game systems that a lot of you guys are clamoring for. You have to understand, I don't think there's going to be a long-term trend in a lot of this stuff. It's the people like me that grew up with it that have the money and the means to go back and collect it. That said, a lot of the people doing that, and most of these people are also posting on video game collecting forums and the like, are not really wise to the greater antiques and collectibles trade. And the people that think they're investing in this stuff long term are really just speculators. So be careful, guys. Again, I got to say this. If you're like me, you have a passion for this stuff. You have the means to own it. You want to own it. You understand the long term cost. Or if you're spending $1,000 or several thousand dollars on video games and systems, that that money really isn't working for you. And you're okay with that. You can afford to do it. Have at it. No problem. Okay, But if you are trying to invest in this stuff and you're calling it an investment, you are most likely dead wrong. Okay, And that's why I make these videos. That's why I hope that people at least watch my content. As I've said before, the subject matter in a lot of these videos pisses a lot of people off. There's a reason why, no matter how much content I produce, no matter how long or how short my videos are, I see my subscriber numbers. It gets to a point where I think now I have like 78, 79 subscribers. I guarantee you a video like this will scare three or four away. Then three or four more over the next several days will watch this video and go, hmm, he brings up some good points. I'm going to subscribe. So it's almost like I'm taking two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, two steps back. It's interesting the dynamics over how this channel is viewed in the YouTube algorithms and some of the comments that I've gotten. Some people love what I do, some people hate what I do. And I really hate to say it, that's pretty much the crux for the articles that I write for Antiques and Auction News as well. There's people out there that hate me. I can do a whole video on emails I've gotten. I've gotten death threats already, guys, for producing this type of content, whether it's in print form or in video form. I think it's hilarious that somebody would risk a jail sentence to, to, to get me off of YouTube or to stop me from writing videos, okay? That said, I value your input. I value your feedback. If you have not subscribed and you are interested in contrarian content like this, of which I try to get you to think in other directions, applied to either financial investing or the greater antiques and collectibles trade, please consider subscribing, okay? It really means a lot to me. I value all you guys who have subscribed already. Believe me, I cannot thank you enough. 
and I appreciate you taking a chance on a crazy guy like me who sits in his home office and just turns on a video camera and pretty much tells you where he thinks certain markets in the antiques and collectibles trade are going. Thanks, guys, and enjoy your night.